right. So I was looking over uh, handicapping the games this week, and I was taking a look at one game in the NFL that intrigued me was the matchup of the two top rookie quarterbacks, the Houston Carolina game. And then I noticed one thing that I, I felt was interesting to bring up and get your take, Mark, uh, especially from the, from the data book. And that is that you have a Houston team. Yes. They've got the rookie quarterback. Yes. Carolina has a rookie quarterback, but the difference in this game I noticed is that Frank Reich veteran head coach he has been through bye weeks before he's coming off a bye. Houston also coming off a bye, but they have a rookie head coach. So that's when I decided, that's when I thought, okay, well, this probably be something to ask you whether or not you found any data regarding, you know, which coaches this week or generally, you know, down the line uh, are good off of a buy or bad off of a buy. And then knowing, of course, that uh, you got to, you got to put a little bit of a, a of a, a chink there, maybe a negative, even though we don't know if it'll be an ultimate negative with, a rookie head coach coming off a buy for the first time in Houston. So uh, does Carolina have an advantage here? Well, yeah. The thing you mentioned to me that really got, kind of caught my attention was uh, going in and looking for data on situations like this. And I can say, when you mentioned that to me, can I, am I able to do that? I can say, yeah, I got a little bit of a woody going on here. Of course I can do that. Let me tell you exactly <laughs> what it is that I found here. Okay. Uh, these are this week. We had six teams that were off last week on bye weeks. Uh, five of them are coached by coaches that have been here before with bye weeks. As Greg mentioned here, uh, D'Amico Ryan says not. He's a rookie coach. But these are the records of the coaches playing this week in their NFL careers when their teams are coming off a of bye week. And we're going to stop. We're going to run this alphabetically here. First team is the Carolina Panthers, as Greg mentioned here. Frank Reich in his career off a of bye week. He's had four times he's been there. He's won all four football games and gone 3-0-1 against the spread. So he does a really masterful job in preparing his team in games with extra rest. Take a look at the Cincinnati Bengals. Zach Taylor, not so good, mediocre, but uh, I would give him a C-. Uh, he's on a bye week here. He's 3-2 and two straight up overall, but only 2-3 and three against the spread. You've got Dallas Mike McCarthy, a veteran who's been around a long while with the Green Bay Packers and the Dallas Cowboys. Obviously, he's been in many, many more games coming up a bye week. He's 12-7 and seven straight up, 13-5-1 and one to the spread. So he's a pretty good coach, is Mike McCarthy, with his teams coming off a of bye week. The New York Jets' Robert Sala, he hasn't been around too long, but he's been here two times coming off a of bye week, and he's failed straight up and against a spread in both games coming off a of bye week. And I want to throw this out because this was in the Playbook newsletter as well. The New York Jets going into this game against the Giants guys, by the way, are 1-13 in the last 14 games coming off a of bye so the Jets kind of maybe eat a little bit too much of that great cooking in the restaurants in the city of New York, and they don't tend to show up for football games after a bye, and Robert Sala is continuing that trend in New York. The final guy playing this week off a bye is the Tennessee Titans' Mike Vrabel, who I think is one of, I think one of the more exceptional coaches in the National Football League. Unfortunately, his hands have been tied a lot last year and this year with injuries, uh, but unfortunately, he'll do a nice job, and he'll get his football team turned around out of this. Vrabel has been five times playing with a bye week in his NFL career with the Titans. He's won all five of those football games, and he's cashed all five of those football games as well. So we'll see whether or not t Tennessee can bounce back off the map this week, whether or not Carolina can get their first win this week with coaches that have never lost in bye week situations. That's what I found, Greg. Yeah, and, and so you got to think that even though Carolina is like one of the more banged up teams in the NFL – that we know means an awful lot. The whole buy situation. We have an unknown with a rookie coach, and also Houston is favored in this game. And this is the first time I believe they're a road favorite since 2020. Yep. Yep. There's and I believe the last time they laid points, they got murdered as a favorite as well, Greg. I'd, I'd like to interject something here. Yes. Uh, Frank Reich is not going to be calling the plays this week. Uh, they have. He's given that up. And um, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Tom. His offensive coordinator, yes. Yep, he's going to be calling the plays. And his background is much more aggressive downfield throws. He's uh, right. Has done a very poor job. As, an, as actually, in most cases, he hasn't done that well as a head coach. But 
with this team calling plays, he's been highly criticized, and they've been asking him to give up the play calling duties for since the beginning of the year, and he's finally done it. He finally put his ego aside and said, "We got to do something." He'll get fired. I mean, the owner. Well, what better time to do it, Jim, than with a bye week to prepare the offensive coordinator with the new duties and the new assignment? And my my answer to that is that statement is. It certainly can't hurt the Carolina Panthers. Uh, they can't do any worse than they've been doing so far. Well, and the other, and the other thing is, but excuse me for a moment. The other thing is, that has to sit well with the players as well, who are probably yeah. wondering why do we have an offensive coordinator who's not calling the plays, considering the guy who is calling the plays, it's not working. Players have to feel and good about this. Take a, take a look at the total in this game. This will go to you, Victor. It opened forty-one and a half. It's up to forty-three and a half, and one place is forty-three and a half minus fifteen, which is. Uh, well, actually, it's, my, my, it's leaning under. So, in, in any case, it's this isn't the kind of a game I would look at and say, "Well, these two teams are uh, over teams," not with what's been going on for the whole year, but now with this new information, somebody has bet this game up two points. Very right. interesting, uh, Victor. How do you see that shaking out from a total standpoint? Well, it's another game in which the road team is favored in the NFL. These have been tremendous underplays, particularly over the last uh, two years. It's probably one of about six or seven, maybe even eight games this week in which the road team is favored. So for me, uh, regardless of the line move, I will not be betting the over in these games. I may track the line move, and maybe when it reaches its zenith, I might come uh, in with a play on the under at that point. If we can get that 44 or maybe 44 and a half, then I would come in on the under myself. Uh, but again, uh, it's one of these situations that we can't explain in the NFL that games in which the road team are favored have gone under at such a high percentage over the last couple of seasons. Greg, any other things you want to throw out at us during this roundtable? That was a great conversation. Yeah, actually, I wanted to, before we move on, Andy, did you say before that uh, something about winless teams off buys? I think that was Mark who had uh, who had done some research on that. Yeah, they've, they've done really rather well, winless teams off of buys. You know, they take that extra week to uh, kind of rub the stain off, if you will, a little bit more focus, a little bit more preparation. And it probably works as much as anything as the other team generally playing down to their level. I don't know if Houston can play much down to their level, but uh, it, that's a fact, though. Okay. Winless teams off a of bye week. By performer. the way, Mark, I know you did it last week with uh, the Giants. Uh, maybe it was the week against Buffalo. Carolina also, according to my numbers, has yet to cover a point spread. 0-5-1 and right. through six right. games. Uh, how do uh, winless teams against the spread this deep into the season do, if you've, if you've got that information? Well, uh, winless teams, the deeper you go, the better they do to the spread. I, excuse me. I shouldn't say winless teams straight up. Winless Teams have yet to cover a point spread. Well, that's a good question, Andy. Uh, I know I hit on it last year with the Giants, and uh, we could probably run it again from an 0-5 and 1 standpoint, but I'll say this, if it worked for the Giants at 0-5, it will certainly work for another team that's 0-5 and 1 to the spread, uh, which with Carolina Panthers would be. So they're kind of in a similar path, a similar uh, road, if you will, that the New York Giants were, yeah. uh, getting out of the gate with no point spread covers. What it basically means is you're getting a lot of value with the football team that basically the public wants no piece of. Which, by the way, seems counterintuitive when you say, how can a three-point home underdog Re, be value when they're winless. That may be a nice key as far as what the right side is in this game. I think there's no question about that. That's a great observation. Okay, so I know it's happened pretty quick, but then again, look at San Francisco. Within a couple of weeks, everybody's wondering, are they the best team after all? Said the same thing about the Cowboys. Well, I'm going to bring this up about whether or not you guys, we'll start off with you, Jim, believe that the Miami Dolphins are overrated. And I say that because their, their five wins have come against losing teams by a 203 to 108 margin. They've destroyed bad teams and they've only played two winning teams and they've lost them both by a 79 to 37 margin. Absolutely overrated. They, they have not, they have not played a schedule that you can give a lot of respect to. Now that's, that's consistent in this league because we have a lot of, I think there's 19 teams that don't even have a winning record. So it, it, this is a league that's 
down this year. It's a B league or a, maybe even a B plus league or B minus league, depending on what your point of view is. So you're, a lot of these teams are playing like Detroit, for example. They didn't play Murderers Row either, and they got handled pretty well last week by the Ravens, who, by the way, um, the Ravens right now should be mentioned in all the conversations as possibly one of the top three or four teams in the league. Now that they're getting healthy and with the quarterback they have and a very good head coach and a very good offensive coordinator, you cannot sleep on that team. As and the defense that's coming around, Jim, as well. Yes, that's right. So, but going back to that, it, when these teams play very poor schedules, it's uh, it's you know we we do it all the time, and in, in when we're when we're handicapping bowl games or playoff games, and we look at the who they played, who they play this year, and you get strength of schedule is big, and it's big during the season as well. So Miami has not really stood up to anybody really good. Now, they've handled the ones that they've handled in a remarkable fashion, so I don't think they're terrible by any stretch, and they could very easily get better. They have a good defensive coordinator. They have a good offensive coordinator, which is their head coach, So they have a lot, and they have a lot of talent. Well, we're going to find out about whether they continue that path this week because they're playing another losing bad football team in New England. So I guess we're going to have to wait a while to gauge them a little bit about playing winning teams. There's one little adage that I always had about strength of schedule, and when one team is, is uh, uh, beats up on poor teams, uh, the, the fact of the matter is those poor teams, the, one, a lot of the losses those poor teams took are against the teams that beat them up that were pretty good. That, to your point, Mark, I was going to mention, that's one of the things that I uh, track, and I'll use Baltimore and Miami as an example. Baltimore is 5-2. and two. Their opponents are 25-18. Uh, excuse me, their, their opponents are 24 tw- and 20. However, when you take out those opponents' games against Baltimore, we find that Baltimore's five wins have been against teams that are a collective 17 and 9 against wow. teams other than Baltimore. And are, now, Baltimore's two losses are against teams that are just 5 and 6 against the rest of the league. Now, when we go to Miami, their opponents are 18 29. Overall, but when you take out the games their opponents played against Miami, Miami has beaten teams that are just eight and twenty against the rest of the NFL. Eight and four are their two losses. So it's it's somewhat surprising that sometimes these good teams end up losing the bad teams and they beat teams that have not done very well against the rest of the league. So I'll throw out the Jets for an example because they're an interesting contrast. They are uh, three and three straight up. Their opponents are 24 and 17. Now the Jets' three wins have come against teams that are 12 and six against the rest of the league. They're playing the Giants, who are two and five. Giants' two wins have come against teams that are four and eight against the rest of the league. That's handicapping 101. A great way to uh, to really get into the true strength of schedules, as Andy Isco just mentioned, about taking out the record of the teams that are involved, uh, the opponents that are involved in a situation like that. So. Uh, if you learn nothing else on the show today, that was a great, great <laughs> point that Andy Isco brought about. I'm not saying that you're not going to learn anything or you didn't learn anything, but that was a great point Andy brought out. Yeah, hey, guys, can I, can I throw out a question here, guys? Sure. It's, a, it's actually like a, an NFL-related uh, trivia question. And uh, let's get maybe Greg, our producer, in here as well. He may have a, an answer as well. But there's only been one team in the NFL this season that has scored 20 points or more in every single game. And guys, I seriously doubt you're going to get it. But can I get a guess from the panel, everybody? The NFL team that has scored 20 points or more in every game this year. Well, I don't want to have to look at my stat and load book because I'd be cheating, Victor. Yes, you would. <laughs> well, considering you said we will never guess it, uh, we're not going to we're not going to think about any of the top teams. So I'm sure well, obviously, you know, you, you think it might be one of the top four teams. There are four teams who are averaging yeah. 28 or like more a Philadelphia points this or somebody, season. Right. Miami, San Francisco, Buffalo, Philadelphia. All four of those guesses would be wrong. The correct answer is the Indianapolis Colts. Oh, my. The only team to score 20 or more in every single game this season. Uh, 
I can't get over what the Colts did to the Browns last week. The oh. easily best defense in the NFL. That's, the, that's Col- the Colts had a 75-yard TD drive, a 75-yard TD drive, a 75-yard TD drive, a 75-yard TD drive, a 57-yard TD drive, and a 41-yard field goal drive. They scored 38 offensive points on over 400 yards of offense against the uh, best defense in the NFL by far. All, All I can say is, yeah, Baltimore has been very impressive. Uh, a team like Jacksonville has been very impressive. Four wins in 19 days in four different locations, basically. But I think this Shane Steichen from the Colts is legit. Well, well Victor, that, that's a bar bet. Little, Nobody, you, everybody would win if you asked that question. That's a beauty. Nobody would guess it, the Indianapolis Colts. Excellent, I can tell you that. excellent. He, Even Colts fans. He, <laughs> yes, Steichen was with Philadelphia last year. Right. Yes, he was, my man. The Super Bowl. He's doing an excellent job. Um, and, 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 and they don't have a great wide receiving core. They have a below average tight end room. They didn't have any running yeah, back. They got two while. stud running backs now with yep. Moss and Taylor, but they've been doing it with a rookie quarterback half the season. And now uh, Uncle Rico, mustache man, Gardner Minshew at quarterback, who had a why, very, why very good underdog? game last week against the Browns. Why are they an underdog? It, it, it flips back and forth, but a one point underdog at times to the Saints. The Saints have done nothing. It I didn't even know why the Saints were favored over Jacksonville last week. Right. That what, made what no sense. The, even I mean, even they, when Lawrence was declared the starter, the line didn't move. It probably goes to the Saints defense more than anything. Uh, it certainly doesn't go to Derek Carr, who's uh, really been a bust of sorts, obviously, since they give him all those big, big dollars. But mm-hmm. you know, the Saints defense is what really keeps him in football games. But, but this is Indianapolis offense that I think uh, they have to worry about this week. Let me ask you a question. Let's just throw this out. You know, if, if, if somebody's working at your house, like a contractor or something, and they haven't finished, finished the job yet, we generally don't pay them all their money until the job is done. Well, in football, these very wealthy and mega wealthy people that own these teams do the opposite. They guarantee contracts. They pay big money to these people, and you get guys like. And I'm not. I'm not accusing anyone, but I'm throwing it out there. Deshaun Watson, Murray down in Arizona. They got their bag, and once you get your bag, are you still as hungry? Do you still want to go out there and get hit and beat up? You got your bag. You're probably never going to make any more than that, and you already got your bag. That's a great point. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't because you own a National Football League team and you're a billionaire. It doesn't give you uh, much for an IQ. It doesn't guarantee that you have a large <laughs> IQ. Well, the thing <laughs> is, is it's an open market, so yeah. it only takes one general manager and one owner, just like they did with Watson. The rest of the the rest of the owners were, as we all know, were very upset when yes. Watson got that deal. Yes. Yeah, they play, to, they play to the fanaticism of the fan base who say, why aren't you doing what this other team is doing to improve the quality of, of the product you're putting out on the field? And that's what drives the salaries up. You know, remember guys like Steinbrenner in baseball for many years would overpay to keep them away from other teams, and the other teams would start uh, demanding He started their, it. The fan he base. was the one. Steinbrenner, good good point, Andy. He, he started it all. I remember growing up and reading those. I, I remember reading the newspaper when Winfield mm. became the first uh, right. million dollar player. I can still remember it, just reading that paper. It just it was such a, a, a change of times in sports. Uh, yeah, I remember when Wayne Garland signed a million dollar contract oh. with the Cleveland Indians. That seemed like all the money in the world at the time, you know. Speaking of Cleveland, they're at Seattle. And nobody knows who's going to be the quarterback for the Cleveland Browns this week. But well, it's, Walker, not, Walker. it's not going to be Watson. They ruled him out. Okay. No, wait, right. They, they, they it's confirmed Walker. it's Walker today. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they can't they can't keep this up, can they? Well, if their defense is, uh, shows up for every football game, they possibly can. Uh, it, the, I think the, the question that begs is when and if Watson is healthy and can play, how good can this football team be? 
You know, and by the way, the the stats that Victor mentioned last week of what uh, Indianapolis did against that Cleveland defense, the Browns still rank number one, allowing just 243 yeah. yards per game. So, uh, you know, even with the one of their, what, uh, six games uh, taken in the database, six or seven games, they still lead the league after that poor effort against Indianapolis. Right. That's how strong their defense was yeah. in the previous games. Absolutely. And what do you guys think about the Jacksonville-Pittsburgh game? Uh, Pittsburgh all of a sudden has woken up. Just a few weeks ago, they couldn't stand. There, there were a lot of fans that just couldn't stand what what they were seeing at quarterback. And Pickett was was not playing well. And the coordinator, I'm sure they still want to get rid of him, but he, they hung in there with Pickett, and he led that late touchdown drive against Baltimore, and it changed everything. And now all of a sudden, they're what four and two, and they're taking on a Jacksonville team that hasn't lost yet since uh since they've uh taken that trip to london so what do you think about this one i think the wrong they got the wrong favorite really you think pittsburgh should be the favorite i it, agree it, with it is a little surprising yes yes i agree too. with that even though pittsburgh stats are rotten i mean as rotten as they get uh, i still think the wrong team is favored because what's being overlooked here is jacksonville is getting very very sloppy in the stats they've been out yarded their last two football games now they're going out road favorites to a football team that really relishes the role that they're going to be in this particular oh, week. Oh, yeah, I think absolutely. This is, a, this is a spot I think Jacksonville can get exposed. Yeah, it's, it's one of the situations where the stats might be a little bit misleading because, Mark, as you point out, 31st in total offense are the Steelers, 274 per game, 30th on defense, allowing 384 per game. And that's, uh, uh, that's those are horrible numbers. What Pittsburgh does well, and they're number four in the league, is they average – 2.0 takeaways per game, which is nice. The only problem, Jacksonville's a little bit better. They've uh, averaged 2.3 takeaways per game, best in the league. So uh, they've been an opportunistic defense, has Jacksonville, so has Pittsburgh. But, uh, you know, you look at their record. When you take a look at these stats, you wonder how they've won any games. Uh, but, again, you go back to that first game against Cleveland, special teams, defensive touchdowns. They happen to be opportunistic uh, when they uh, get that opportunity. I don't know how long this can hold up, uh, but they are in a division where you do have a questionable quarterback in uh, in Cleveland right now with with, with Watson. Uh, Burrow seems to be healthy, but Cincinnati has some ground to make up because their offense has not been productive. That Baltimore entire right now division be, could make the playoffs, and maybe should make yes. the playoffs. Well, they could when you look around the league. I mean, yeah. we thought we thought the Chargers and Denver would be legitimate challengers in the west of Kansas City. That doesn't appear to be the case. It looked as it looks now that Jacksonville is the best team in what is at best an average AFC South. I mean, I think Jacksonville won the division last year at nine and eight. And you look at the East, maybe that's the one team. You know, if you're t if you're taking a look at maybe three of the four teams in the uh, AFC North will get in. Maybe that'll be because both Miami and Buffalo make the playoffs. You know, to Jim's point here, guys, uh, I also I agree with them that the wrong team is favored. Uh, Pittsburgh is a different animal at home than they are on the road as well. Uh, they tend to protect their home turf pretty well. And now you dress them as an underdog. You go look at Mike Tomlin's record as an underdog. It's absolutely outstanding. That's one of the reasons I think there's an upset in the making in that game. Well, he does not get the kind of credit that he deserves as being an outstanding coach for 15, 16 years. Yeah, Never I'm had a losing season. I was just going to ask that. How long has he been a coach? 15, 16 years. The guy plays old schools, 1950, 1960 football. And he's just tough. He's a tough character. Um, he knows what he's doing. He doesn't have all the talent in the world. You know, not everybody on that team, maybe the defensive side, he has a tremendous talent. But the offensive side, he just plugs along and waits for you to make a mistake. And he takes advantage Hey, Victor, didn't Mike Tomlin uh, coach under Chuck Knoll? Am I correct on that? Yes, absolutely did, too. And, you know, uh, again, this is uncharted water for the Jaguars. It's the fact that they are 4-0 in their last four games, that they are laying points on the road, but the true line should be the Steelers minus three in this particular game. I mean, no team has ever returned from playing Europe twice and not played with rest the next week. At some point, that all Catch has up. to come catching up and crashing down therefore a like 24 to 10 or 24 to 13 Steeler win would not surprise us at all 
Well, they do have the extra few days from the Thursday game. That might help them. They have a bye next week. Maybe psychologically that works against them, thinking about the bye. They'll uh, bye finally next week, right? Yeah. yeah. And and by the way, here's contrasting trends. As you mentioned with Pittsburgh as a home dog, 12-2-4 in their last 18 in, in that scenario. 2-1 and one this year in that, in that spot. Jacksonville, though, 4-0 straight up and against the spread away from home this year because that's London. So away from home, 4-0, and 7-0 against the spread in their last seven away from home. So that's contrasting uh, trends. Pittsburgh's got a little bit longer lasting one, a little bit longer proving one. So we'll see if the line moves at all. I want to switch over to college and ask you about the big play because this just, just drives me nuts. College football officiating with the targeting rule and just with the whole idea of – it's sort of reminding me, guys, uh, as as hockey fans, uh, of the of, of the year that they had the instant replay first established with the with the crease and and the goaltender interference. It would drive you nuts almost every play, every goal. You had to wait to find out if the official was going to call interference on the, uh, against the goaltender, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that's what's happening in college football right now. And in the Iowa-Minnesota game, to me, that was just an absolute travesty. Look, as a, as a football fan, isn't this all – I mean, everybody talks about the NFL and they're trying to make it offensive and all that. Well, I'm sure college football want, wants to be exciting and offensive too. Well, then, how do you – I mean, how they come up with this ridiculous rule – that the guy was calling a fair catch or he was moving his hand the wrong way and he scores a touchdown and the place is going bananas and then they take it away. It's just, you can't have that in the game. You just well, can't. You not, right. not for you... something that, 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 that change the rule then. If you want to say that they, 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 they followed the letter of the rule, that is a bad rule. Well, you were right. That game was very offensive, offensive to those sensibilities of us who enjoy football because very little happened. But as I understand the rule, he didn't even really signal for a fair catch because didn't the arm have to be raised above I a certain so. like waist or something? And clearly it was not. It almost looked like he was shooing guys away from him, like he was saying, yes. get away, get away, get away. Yes. And he was probably looking to see the ball go out of bounds and not touch himself. And then he realized I could pick it up and run and uh, caught the uh, – that may be one of the worst – uh, rulings ever. Now, I don't know if that was reviewable or not. Uh, it may not have been because I would have thought if they reviewed it, they would have come to that conclusion that that was a a, a legitimate uh, play, that there was no there was no valid fair catch signal. I don't know if it was reviewable. Well, unfortunately, you know, Iowa, there would be a one-loss team and they'd be in contention, if you yep. will, uh, with, uh, with, with Wisconsin over yep. in their division. And, now uh, they're done. Yeah, now they're done. What they what they need to do, Iowa, though, is find a little more offense. I mean, <laughs> 230 yards a game isn't going to get it done. Well, haven't, they been looking, haven't they been looking for offense for the last 20 years? Yep. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen a total un, unrelated to weather that was 30 and a half like it was in that game. <laughs> right. I, I remember I, – I can't remember the name of the quarterback, but remember they had that black quarterback about 20, 25 years ago, and they had a couple of years where their offense was amazing. I can't remember the name of the quarterback, though. He never went on and did anything in the NFL. But, uh, yeah, that was the first time and the only time I ever remember an Iowa team. It was, it was probably a period when Kirk Ferentz didn't go on recruiting trips. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, after that touchdown that was taken back, the first thing I started thinking about was whether Cooper DeGene should have, should have been elevated up to one of the top Heisman contenders. And they took that away from him, too. Because how could you not give him an opportunity to be a Heisman contender if that was going to be his second punt return game-winning touchdown? That's just amazing, considering he's he's an all-pro uh, caliber college football DB to begin with. Yeah, and he would have been on a 7-1 team, as you mentioned. You know? Yeah, so right. anyway, um, that'll wrap it up.